my choice I surrender or because I know how to I surrender not because I decide I surrender these things are beyond my mind like a vine coaxed by the sun hello everyone and welcome to the local hero awards we welcome you to say hi in chat let us know where you're zooming from and maybe share your favorite local park you can see one of mine in back of me, it's Glen Canyon Park in San Francisco. So I'm Regina Ridley, Executive Director of Bay Nature, and I want to welcome you to the 11th Annual Local Hero Awards, where we will celebrate five remarkable human beings who have done so much for the natural world of the Bay Area. The 2021 Local Heroes are Wendy Elliott, Conservation Action, Clayton Anderson, environmental educator. Emma Lewis, young leader. Jose Gonzalez, community hero. And Doug McConnell, Bay Nature local hero. Today is also a celebration of Bay Nature magazine. Our winter issue marked our 20th anniversary. Quite amazing tenure for any magazine, especially a local nonprofit one focused on the stories of nature, wildlife, and the environment. We are here because you care so much about the work we do and have been so generous with your support over two decades. I'd also like to thank the many sponsors who have supported us today including lead organizational sponsors, Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria, Google, East Bay Regional Park District, Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District, Save the Redwoods League, and Sonoma Land Trust. Thank you to all our organizational and in-kind sponsors. Thank you to our lead individual sponsors, Nancy and Bart Westcott and Jorgen Hildebrand, and all our individual sponsors. Thank you to our many VIP ticket buyers. And thank you to our co-founders, David Loeb and Malcolm Margolin, without whom there would be no Bay Nature. Thank you to our wonderful board of directors who are a constant source of encouragement and support and to the amazing Bay Nature staff who I get to work with every day. To start our program, I'd like to honor the Bay Area's many diverse indigenous peoples who have lived here in the beautiful Bay Area for thousands of years 
and continue to live and thrive here. We respect your indigenous sovereignty and thank you for your stewardship of our natural world and the example you show us. Now, over to you, Bruce Hartsaw. Thank you, Regina. Hello, I'm Bruce Hartsaw, the board chair of the Bay Nature Institute. This afternoon, I am honored to have the opportunity to introduce you to Wendy Elliott, Bay Nature's Local Hero Award winner for Conservation Action. Wendy Elliott accepted a job as the land acquisition manager at what was then a small organization, the Sonoma Land Trust, in the late 1990s. During her 21 years of working for the Sonoma Land Trust prior to retiring, or at least allegedly retiring, as the Director of Conservation earlier this year, Wendy secured over $50 million of funding and conducted complex negotiations to protect nearly 20,000 acres of parks, habitats, and working lands, ranging from the Sonoma Baylands to Lake Sonoma to the coast. Wendy began her work at Sonoma Land Trust at a time when its collection of conservation easements was spread across the county more opportunistically than strategically. She advanced groundbreaking regional conservation strategies, including the Sonoma Valley Wildlife Corridor, the, the Southeast Santa Rosa Greenway, and protection of over 5,000 acres of lands along the San Francisco Bay for restoration to counter the impacts of sea level rise and to provide vital habitat and human infrastructure. Wendy's conservation work sits at the intersection of nature and relationships with people and it's those relationships as much as the land that she has protected that make Wendy such a deeply admired leader here in Sonoma County, a place that both she and I call home. Let's listen now as Wendy shares some of the lessons that she has learned from her decades in land protection, as well as some of her thoughts on the future. Thank you, Bruce, for that very nice introduction. And thank you, Bay Nature, for this award. I'm really humbled to be sharing this honor with Clayton, Doug, Emma, and Jose, and with all of you. I only wish I could see your smiling faces out there. I share this award, of course, with my amazing colleagues at Sonoma Land Trust who bring such passion, vision, and creativity to our work. I miss them. I can't wait to see what they do next. It's gratifying to receive this award from Bay Nature. Bay Nature knows that we learn to love what we understand, and we work to say what we love. It brings stories into our living rooms that foster that understanding. First slide, please. So I retired from Cinema Land Trust last October after 21 years, but my career in conservation goes way back to my childhood. I came to this work probably like most of you because I fell in love with nature and I wanted to devote my career to it. Now I'm looking back to glean some lessons learned along the way. Well, probably more accurate to say I'm still learning, so I have four lessons learning to share with you and a couple of thoughts about the future. Next slide, please. My first lesson and probably the most important one and the one that Bruce mentioned is that although we're in the business of protecting nature, conservation is really all about people and building relationships. In our work, we get a window into so many different communities and I cherish so many memories of the kitchen table conversations, negotiating with landowners, the bone rattling ranch tours in the back of pickup trucks and getting all dressed up to meet with the San Francisco Society Maven only to have her greet us at the door in her slippers and a bathrobe. It's been about learning to work with all kinds of people and finding ground, common ground, even when you least expect it. I am forever grateful for the invitations into lives that are so different from mine. One of my proudest moments at Sonoma Land Trust was answering the call to help create a greenway through Santa Rosa, two miles of open space that will bring nature close to home for thousands of Santa Rosa residents. I learned humbling lessons about letting go of having the answers and instead of listening to what the community wants to see. When we tap into that jerk connection to nature, it is a powerful force to say what we love. Second lesson I have, is we need to keep protecting our home, land. As Mark Twain said, they aren't making it anymore. Next slide, please. When I started at Sonoma Land Trust, we talked about protecting big iconic properties. We fantasized about what we would do if we had a hundred million to spend. And we poured over maps and drew circles around the largest undeveloped properties. We tallied our successes by acres and dollars. And we protected some amazing places like the Jenner Headlands on the coast, 
Sears Point in the Baylands, and one of my favorites, Tolle Creek Ranch. And incidentally, all of these places are open to the public. You can go check them out. Next slide, please. And here's a picture of Tolle in the springtime with the incredible flower display, which unfortunately you've missed this year, but next year. Um, Sonoma Land Trust is still focused on protecting land, but today the goals look different. We know that land conservation is an effective way to ensure nature's resiliency to climate change and extreme events. So you're more likely to hear goals measured in terms like miles of salmon streams restored, corridors for wildlife to travel safely, watersheds protected for clean water, farms and ranches providing food, and urban parks, places for people to enjoy nature in our cities and towns. Now we talk about protecting landscapes for nature and for people. Next slide, please. So lesson three, have a plan and be ready to change it. In conservation, we need to work together to figure out where we're headed and be open to changing our plans, our destinations, and our minds. A good example of this was an early regional plan in the Bay Area called the Baylands Habitat Goals. This visionary plan called for restoring the wetlands that once fringed the Bay and galvanized an extraordinary response. Since its publication in 1999, a broad coalition has protected and restored tens of thousands of acres and opened miles of trails where you can experience the emergence of new marshes. But as good as it was at setting out a roadmap, things change and don't we know that? Back in the 90s, few knew that climate change was going to be the defining issue of this century. I sure didn't. In response, the balance were updated to incorporate climate change in 2016. And one of the key findings is that restored wetlands will help to buffer the impacts of sea level rise in the Bay. They are, in fact, our best hope for a climate resilient shoreline. And remember that coalition of committed folks? They are still working, but with even more urgency and with new partners to meet the challenge ahead. Next slide, please. So my last lesson is be brave and take risks. In the acquisition department at Sonoma Land Trust, we always prided ourselves on finding that sweet spot between recklessness and caution. Sometimes the risks felt very personal. I have a little secret for you. I'm afraid of flying. So picture this, after a year of courtship, we finally got a meeting with Fred Dixon, the farmer who owned the land along the way. Land Trust wanted to buy this property because without it, we wouldn't be able to restore that continuous band of wetlands called for in the balance plan. But it was early days of building trust with Fred, and I was a very long way from a deal. He showed me around the ranch and reeled out his pride and joy, a little red biplane. It looked like a tinker toy with cloth wings. It was cute. He mentioned he did trick flying and I shuddered to imagine doing barrel rolls in that open cockpit. Then to my horror, you saw this coming, Fred looked me in the eye and asked, do you wanna go up? Well, you can guess what I did. I didn't, no, of course I did. I did, however, take the precautionary step of negotiating a no barrel rolls agreement before climbing into that little plane. And yes, Fred did eventually agree to sell. So be brave, take risks, and try things. Next slide. So now as I look to the future, what can I offer you? Well, we know that climate change is a global crisis. So what would it look like if we responded to the loss of biodiversity and the threat of climate change like a life-threatening pandemic? Like an emergency, like the emergency it is. And what can we learn from our successes? So let's look at the Balin's example again. How have we been able to turn the tide on the loss of wetlands in San Francisco Bay? I think it's because, sort of simple, we collectively decided it was important. It was important to restore these marshes. We had a consensus plan of action. We passed laws to protect the plants and animals that live there. We had broad community support, the whole spectrum from duck hunters to birders. We invested a whole lot of money and we acted based on the best information we had at the time. So here are a couple thoughts. We need to work together across all communities. We need to listen more, share resources and power, and make sure that the benefits of our work are enjoyed equitably. We must bring a regional approach to the climate change challenge. Over the past three years, 
I'm going to go out on a limb here and say every one of us learned that the impacts of wildfire are felt across the bay and affect all of us. We must look past our boundaries and over fence lines and collaborate on solutions across the region, not just in our backyards. Three, we need to act now to double down on protecting and caring for the landscapes that sustain us. We can answer the call to protect and conserve at least 30% of California's natural and working lands and create more parks and open space in our cities and towns. With President Biden in the White House, few the economic recovery coming and a 2022 state bond on the horizon, this is our chance to invest in climate change at a scale that makes a difference and makes an impact. How do we do that? We all must advocate for new climate change policies and funding and support the good work of organizations like Together Bay Area, Bay Nature and others, my fellow honorees particularly, and Sonoma Land Trust, I had to put a project, product placement in there, who amplify our voices in the Bay Area, Sacramento, and in Washington. Back when we were going to the office, I take early morning walks in the Laguna de Santa Rosa, that vast wetlands west of Santa Rosa. There's a sign there with a simple message, it really struck me. It says, make the Laguna swimmable again. There's so much embedded in that simple message. It conveys the discouraging fact that we've polluted our water and at the same time offers this little glimpse of hope with an image, outrageous as it may seem today, of one day swimming in the Laguna. I will never forget the day when we opened the levees at the Sears Point Restoration Project, watching as the tides returned after 150 years and with the tides, the return of that complex web of life. Fields that produced hay are now producing ducks and curlews, leopard sharks and striped bass, pickleweed and cordgrass. We do have the ability to undo the mistakes of our past and help nature restore itself. I have so much hope for the future. I've seen this community learn and grow together and though we still have far to go, we are committed to going there together. Thank you again so much for this award. Thanks so much, Wendy, for sharing your wisdom with us tonight. My name is Ahn Tran, board member for Bay Nature, and I'm delighted to introduce you to Clayton Anderson, recipient of the Environmental Educator Award. Clayton is currently the youth program Clayton Anderson is currently the Youth Programs Manager at Golden Gate Audubon. In this role, he provides year-round environmental education to Title I elementary students in the third, fourth, and fifth grades in Oakland, Richmond, and San Francisco. In addition, he hosted classes at the Rotary Nature Center at Lake Merritt. He was part of a team that worked with the city of Oakland to reopen the space, believing that it could be a strategic teaching center for Golden Gate Audubon classes. He has led walks for Outdoor Acro, a national nonprofit that celebrates and inspires Black connections and leadership in nature. Clayton is an environmental educator and professional artist who became a naturalist and birder as a child. He has worked with a number of environmental education organizations, including California State Parks and Recreation, East Bay Regional Park District, the Oakland Museum, and Golden Gate Audubon. He is very knowledgeable and experienced naturalist, is friendly, welcoming, and reaches out to a wide variety and diversity of people of all ages, social, social, cultural, and educate, educational backgrounds. He has made nature and the outdoors accessible to a variety of populations who have not had access to outdoor activities and the natural world. Please join me in honoring this year's environmental educator, Clayton Anderson. Thank you, Ann, and thank you, uh, Bay Nature. 20 years, it's amazing. And thank you to all the other, uh, congratulations to all the other recipients, uh, well done. Um, I have been in environmental education for well over 10 years, um, going on more like 15. Um, do we have slides? So here I am in my precocious years 
with my favorite shirt on. This is my favorite shirt because I thought it was plants. It was green and it had all these little shapes that reminded me of plants. Favorite all time shirt. So I was always into nature from the very beginning, from the get go. So um, next slide. I um, went all through high school and got my first job working for a group called Love Life down in, uh, they were centered, I believe in Palo Alto. And this is my first brochure for that organization, nonprofit. And I learned that there were other people out there just like me who were just nerded out on nature and loved it and all its different aspects. So this is part of that brochure, one of my drawings for that brochure. Next slide. And here I am uh, dubiously watching a tarantula and learning more about Mount Diablo and all the um, amazing biomes around the bay. Um, next slide. And this is a picture of a drawing. Well, this is a drawing that I discovered uh, or this sign. I, I did this sign maybe 35 years ago uh, when I was working at Big Basin and met um, some of the guys who started the museum there. And any of you have been to Big Basin, you know, there used to be a small museum there. Um, and I did the sign at, at that time, that was in 80, somewhere in the early, late eighties. And then went back a few years ago and rediscovered the sign was still being used. It was really pleasing to see that. And um, so I've been, nature and art has been my life. Um, so I just wanted to share that. Next slide. And about, I've been a mentor for many, many kids, many, many kids, and always trying to instill the lessons I learned through nature. Um, and it's just been a joy to, to work with kids in the Oakland area and, and continue to this day, of course. So this is uh, Simba, which is a, a men's chapter uh, mentoring young boys. So next slide. And this, I've been worked for many, as uh, Jan said, um, I work for many uh, environmental organizations. And this one, I um, was actually got to make, help the kids make birdhouses. And that was really fun. If you ever go over to Hoover Garden, which is an amazing place, um, some of my birdhouses are there. Um, yeah, so that was, it's been a, a roller coaster. Next slide. And to the, today, I'm now working with uh, Golden Gate Audubon as their youth program manager. Uh, we work, we get down to the nitty gritty with what kids are really looking at and what it all means. Um, I really am a strong proponent and believer of in the, the concept of if you understand nature's systems, then we'll all be better for it because this is our home and it's the only home we have so far. So learning about nature is the num is the first line of defense in protecting our home so education is key um our eco ed program is over 10 years old and has been was led by some great folks and to this day it's still going strong and we just can we hope to continue with that next slide and these are, here's some of the work that the kids do. We get them out in the field and we work on our units of, of birds, of course, mammals and, or animals, uh, native plants and pollution. So we always run through those units and we get the kids to write what they see, put down, and if they can't write, draw. And if you can't draw, write. But we, and we try to get them to do both. Next slide. And here's a kid who was just totally angry when he got off the bus and really grumpy and pushing people and really unhappy and not talking to anyone and grunting and whatnot. And by the time that crab showed up, he was lost. He was, you got this kind of smile. And this is why I do the work I do because you turn a kid like that into a kid like this and it's, it's, it's immeasurable the difference you make. That kid smiled for the rest of the day. Next slide. And here's some kids. We also take our kids to Alcatraz. Um, we raise all of our funds for our buses. And if you, any of you have been in education know that 
Uh, buses are very expensive, um, but we, we do all the footwork, raise the money, and we get these kids out. Some of these kids have never been outside of their, their city, never been to the ocean, never been to Alcatraz. So when we take them, you can see they're all smiles. Uh, next slide. And of course, birding, birding, birding. And here's a couple of kids that were goofing. The two on the right are brother and sister <laughs> and uh, typical. But uh, we get them out and we, we have binoculars and we bird. And we also loan out binoculars too. And last slide. Next slide. So if you want to find me, you can go to nature and I'll be there. Uh, hopefully leading a bunch of kids or a bunch of adults and continuing to educate about our natural systems because that's what's going to save us is understanding how we work with our natural systems, the importance that it has for us. Um, so I want to thank Bay Nature again. I'm really humbled by this award. Um, thank you to all the, uh, or congratulations to all the recipients. And uh, just thank you. And, um, and uh, thank you again. And thank you, Clayton, for sharing your experiences and your inspirational work with us and for the work that you do. Our uh, Bay Nature local hero, Doug McConnell, couldn't be here today. He's super busy these past few weeks filming Open Road's current season. However, he was able to pause a couple of days ago to share some reflections with us. Well, hello, everybody. I'm, I'm really sorry I can't be with you uh, this evening. Um, but it's not because I don't care. I really do. I'm very, very touched by the recognition. And um, I'm not sure I feel particularly heroic, but I, but I, I just, um, it means a lot to me. So I, I want to be here at least through this medium to, to say thank you. This has been the reason I'm not here. It's been just the busiest production month I think we've had for Open Road, the series we do on NBC uh, every week. And um, I've been in the field with my wonderful photographers, uh, all week long, and so uh, I, I hope by my sending this, uh, you don't take it as a, a lack of uh, uh, recognition for the recognition. This really does mean a lot to me. I'm, I'm very, very touched, but I, I want to be here to say particularly congratulations to the other honorees. I'm just, um, I'm honored to be in their number. These are people I, whose work I know very well. I've followed it for what they have done, what they are doing, and I just want to thank each of them for the great work they do on behalf of all of us and future generations, and um, I look forward to tracking along with their work as we move ahead. And I also really want to thank uh, Bay Nature. I've been a big fan of Bay Nature since its inception over all these years, and I'm just really blown away. I'm in awe of, of the quality of its work, the, uh, the quality of its content, of its writing, of, of, the, um, of its photography, graphics. It's a, uh, I think it's really a world-class publication. It's our, sort of our National Geographic of our region. And I know how difficult it is to produce that kind of content on a regular basis so well for so long on a limited staff and, and uh, limited resources. And so I just bow in Bay Nature's direction uh, I thank them for all they have done for all of us. Bay Nature plays a, a critical role in our information ecosystem, and um, I'm here to continue my support for it. I want to thank all of you who are, uh, for your support for Bay Nature as well. So uh, a bow to the other honorees, most especially, and Bay Nature. And, um, I, and I'm not going to say too much here, because on Tuesday, <laughs> I get to have a wonderful, free-flowing conversation with Victoria at 4 o'clock. And uh, I hope many of you come to uh, listen in, join in, ask questions. It's going to be a lot of fun. I have no idea where she wants to go with the conversation, but I'll, I'll follow any conversational path she wants to, uh, to go down. So uh, that'll be, to me, a lot of fun. You'll hear more from me then than you probably want to hear. Uh, so, but very quickly, just on you know, my background, I, uh, my family has been in California for six generations. I uh, have a couple little granddaughters who live in the East Bay. They are sixth-generation California natives. 
I was uh, born in Santa Monica. We lived in Fresno and then in the Sacramento Valley up north of Yuba City in Marysville when I was growing up. And my mom and dad were backroads people and outdoors people. So that's, that's really what we did with what spare time we had. And we grabbed every spare moment we could to explore the state and, and really enjoy uh, the outdoors and nature, our national parks, state parks, public lands and open space from the Sierra to the coast and the desert uh, from the north to the south. I, I was very, very lucky to get to know the state well, to fall in love with it and to fall in love with nature, which has been a uh, consuming passion of mine my entire life. And, and also being born literally at the end of World War II, uh, when California's population was maybe a little north of 9 million uh, and now it's 40 million. Uh, I saw, especially in the first couple of decades of my life, that many precious places that I cared deeply about were being paved over, being lost, and, and, uh, and most of them lost forever. And the bay was being filled in. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I, I learned very quickly that nature is precious and vulnerable, and if we care for it, if we care for her, we have to fight to protect it and uh, do everything in our power to protect and when we can restore the natural world. So these are issues, ideas, topics that have fueled my entire life. After I graduated from college uh, in the uh, late 60s, 1967, Pomona College, go Sage Hens. Uh, Sherry Cardo, if you're uh, checking in with the Sonoma Land Trust, fellow Sage, Pomona Sage Hen, here's to you. Uh, but after I left college in 67, went off to graduate school and then lived and worked in many parts of the United States and around the world, uh, mostly at the intersection of uh, conservation and communications, many years in Alaska. Uh, after 16 years, my wife Kathy and I were having our first baby uh, in 1983, and that's when it was time to come back home, to come back to the Bay Area, to, um, to raise our family, and for me to do the kind of work I've had a chance to do uh, for all these years. Now, that was 38 years ago. Um, and I was uh, 38 when I came back. So uh, amazingly, half of my life has been spent roaming around with wonderful teams, wonderful photographers, uh, putting the spotlight to the, most, uh, to the greatest extent on extraordinary people doing extraordinary work in extraordinary places on our behalf. And uh, uh, it's been just one of the great gifts in life to have had this opportunity for so long uh, to meet so many inspiring people to see solutions in action, to, uh, uh, to be given lots of hope for what the future can be despite all the challenges that we, that we face. And so in the course of all of that, um, uh, it's been like a continuing education. As an old liberal arts major, I just love to learn things. I, I don't think I know much, but I, get to, I love to learn. And uh, I've learned quite a bit over these years. And during the past uh, year or more, really, uh, with the pandemic, and our plague of fires, uh, I've, I've had lessons uh, reinforced. Uh, and uh, I think I'll close with just that thought. Uh, you know, it's become very clear that our personal health, uh, the health of our communities, all of our communities, all of our people, each and every one of us, uh, all depends on the health of nature. We're, uh, we're part of an uh, indivisible uh, ecosystem in the uh, often paraphrased words of uh, uh, possibly said by Chief Seattle, um, nature doesn't belong to us, we belong to it. And I think among the headlines of these last couple of years, what I've learned most of all is to heal ourselves. We've got to heal nature and we have to begin by healing our relationship to nature. Uh, I would say moving forward with my life, I've been so pleased to live in what's really the epicenter of conservation, restoration, and uh, social equity uh, uh, justice, the innovation conservation, restoration, and social equity. This is the, uh, the Silicon Valley of, of, of those topics in really in the world. And so when I think of any place that can have a great chance to uh, restore itself, improve itself, and, and, and give us a bright future with climate change and everything else we have to deal with, uh, it's going to be big, big challenges. There's an immense amount of work to do, but I think we are, have long been pointed in the right direction, and we're in a place where we can lead the way. So for me, I am just 
very happy to be part of all of this. I'm very happy to be with all of you who are working so hard on all of this, with our honorees who are helping to lead the way, with Bay Nature, which is helping to lead the way. And uh, I, just as long as I possibly can, will be with you and uh, doing what I can to help out. So again, thank you so much. Here's to a great evening ahead for everybody. And I uh, hope to see as many of you as possible on Tuesday. Thanks. Many thanks to Doug for his kind words about Bay Nature. Our editor-in-chief, Victoria Schlesinger, will be interviewing Doug on Tuesday at 4. Uh, so if you haven't registered for the event and would like to, you can do so at baynature.org, or we'll put the link in the chat, and uh, we'll also send it out. Um, the immense challenges of the past year have reminded us all about how important nature is to everyone and the critical role that Bay Nature plays in encouraging people to go outside, explore, and soak up all that nature has to offer. Your support allows us to publish an astonishingly broad variety of stories about the natural world of the Bay Area, stories you won't see anywhere else. On our website and in every issue, you hear from diverse voices and find rigorously reported environmental science stories inviting descriptions of local parks and open space you may not be familiar with, and coverage of critical Bay Area conservation topics. Please take this moment to support local environmental journalism and consider making a gift or another gift to Bay Nature. Our longtime donor, Jorgen Hildebrand, started us off with a $5,000 match for what we raise around the Local Hero Awards. And you are welcome to type in a pledge and we'll follow up in chat. Um, or uh, go to baynature.org slash donate. So now it's time to celebrate our next two heroes. And here's my colleague, Haley Davis. Thank you, Regina. And hello, everyone. My name is Haley Davis. I'm an associate editor at Bay Nature. And it's my pleasure to introduce our next local hero, Emma Lewis, our Young Leader Award recipient. In the Bay Area, our urban parks serve as important places for not only connecting with nature in the city, but also if managed with biodiversity in mind as pockets of nature where native species we know and love can thrive. San Bruno Mountain is one such landscape, an urban biodiversity hotspot home to endemic plant species and native wildlife that persists on the San Francisco Peninsula. Part of that landscape is a smaller hill with lettering that reads South San Francisco, the industrial city called Cyan Hill. Before Emma came along, Cyan Hill was basically unmanaged parkland full of plenty of both native and invasive species. In 2019, the city of South San Francisco was able to bring on Emma Lewis, a new grad with degrees in environmental science and studio art from the University of Virginia with a passion for plants, wildlife and conservation to kick off the Cyan Hill Habitat Restoration Project as a natural resource specialist. So far in her brief but remarkably impactful career, Emma has built this program from the ground up, surveying the park's native and invasive plants, figuring out how to help the endangered Mission Blue butterfly thrive and recruiting Cyan Hill stewards, a team of volunteers to help with the physical restoration work, building a community around the special place in the process. And with that, we're so pleased to present Emma Lewis with our 2021 Young Leader Award. Thank you, Haley, for the wonderful introduction, Regina and the Bay Nature team. This is such an honor and privilege to be recognized as a local hero. Many of today's heroes and past heroes have been an inspiration to me as I've navigated the environmental field in the Bay Area. I sincerely thank you all for the work that you do. My name is Emma Lewis and I'm a naturalist with the city of South San Francisco. I've decided to take this time to speak about an ecosystem and community that is dear to me, how my own history intersects with this ecosystem and the lessons it's taught me about our presence, role and responsibilities in nature. I'm going to take you through a visual journey an experience you might've had if you visited me for a nature walk or volunteer work day. The images you'll see are a compilation of my own photos and artwork, as well as historic images from sources like the San Bruno Mountain Archives. Let's start with a familiar sight, South San Francisco, the industrial city. You've likely seen this message traveling northbound towards San Francisco on Highway 101. 
For residents of South San Francisco, the letters are a given part of their skyline and heritage. Originally installed in 1923, the letters served as both an advertisement and a symbol for the city. What can we take away from these historic letters? I've noticed for many, especially environmentally minded people, the sign seems outdated, a reminder of our legacy of environmental de degradation. For example, activists working to save San Bruno Mountain once chalked, save San Bruno Mountain, no industrial city. What can be farther from nature than the industrial city? As a natural resource specialist with the city's Parks and Recreation Department, I oversee the Sign Hill Habitat Restoration Project. I've grown to love these letters and the stories they tell us about our relationship with nature. As you'll learn, they protected the park in a few surprising ways. A visit to Sign Hill Park starts with a steep trail through pockets of native grassland interspersed with landscaping trees like Monterey Pine planted in the 1980s. You're rewarded with one of the best views of the San Francisco Bay, surpassed only by the nearby San Bruno Mountain. It immediately becomes apparent you're standing in a special place, revealed further by studying the nature and history that surrounds you. Sign Hill is the ancestral land of the Ramata Shaloni. For millennia, indigenous people tended Sign Hill and the nearby San Bruno Mountain as plentiful grassland. You can see their care in the rich ecosystem that remains and the voices and actions of their community today. Spanish colonizers arrived in the late 1700s and through land grants and missions forcibly removed native people and nearly destroyed their way of life. The Spanish brought cattle to graze on Sign Hill's grasslands, introducing invasive annual plants that continue to disrupt the Sign Hill ecosystem, a constant and painful reminder of colonization. Fast forward to the 1900s when Sign Hill's letters were initially installed. The land around Sign Hill began to fill in with development as the city of South San Francisco grew yet Sign Hill Park remained. I like to show these photos because they demonstrate how Sign Hill was continuous with San Bruno Mountain and just how much of it was grassland. And both of these photos were taken during the 1930s. Here's another iconic photo on Sign Hill. It shows a woman surrounded by coast iris in 1910. Coast iris is now a rare plant that we work to conserve on Sign Hill. These pictures just go to show how much biodiversity was and is present on Sign Hill. Sign Hill floats like Lent Island, surrounded by neighborhoods on all four sides. It's home to remnant coastal prairie that once covered the San Francisco Peninsula. Sign Hill's biodiversity, despite its uh, proximity to urban areas, is stunning. It provides habitat for a variety of sensitive species like the federally endangered Mission Blue Butterfly. Ironically, one of the reasons this biodiversity still exists, why the park was never developed, is because of the letters, South San Francisco, the industrial city. The letters are even listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Because of, Sign, because of Sign Hill's proximity to us, it presents endless opportunities for environmental stewardship and engagement. Sign Hill Park is only a short walk away from many South City residents. One of the best parts of my job has been meeting the residents who care for Sign Hill Park. Runners, dog walkers, families, Sign Hill is their backyard. My work on Sign Hill began as a Measure K grant from the County of San Mateo in 2019. I was given the job of launching a two-year habitat restoration project and recruiting a few volunteers each month to help install native plants and remove invasive plants. Since then, with the help of supportive supervisors and community members, we've expanded our vision for Sign Hill, one in which our city stewards the park and its precious natural resources through an education, research, and thoughtful land management. My own background has taught me the importance of having access to the outdoors. I grew up in Virginia in a semi-rural area, and if you read the article about me, I did in fact uh, grow up in a log cabin styled house, as you can see it pictured. Many of the memories that stand out from my childhood have something in common, exploring the outdoors. I was privileged to grow up in a home with over 12 acres of trees, ponds, and critters to learn from, and here are three of my favorites. It wasn't until I moved to California after college that I realized what a special childhood I had. Working as an AmeriCorps member in Silicon Valley, I learned just how much children relied on public lands to experience the outdoors. I also saw the racial inequalities and in who had access to natural spaces with marginalized communities of color often left out. I've chosen this career because of my days exploring nature in Virginia. I love the natural world because I was able to as a child. In my work, I've seen inspiring examples of stewardship 
Prior to the pandemic, I had a family of volunteers who chil whose children would race up to the top of Sign Hill every single day, and seriously, Sign Hill is steep. They came to many of my volunteer events and even requested Sign Hill plant guides to supplement their science curriculum. During the pandemic, they sent me photos of wildlife they found and volunteered on their own to remove invasive plants, as you can see pictured. Another steward that stands out is a student at the City College of San Francisco. She is currently working to develop an initial population estimate for Sign Hill's mission blue butterflies through egg surveys. She moved to California with her family during the pandemic and is finding community and a sense of place through stewardship. Each one of my volunteers has a unique perspective and story. Working with them this past year in small COVID safe appointments has kept me grounded in community despite everything. And let me tell you, the work they're doing is making a serious impact. On the left, you can see photos taken during a volunteer event in winter 2020, and this was prior to the pandemic. Volunteers are installing native plants from the Mission Bloom Nursery, primarily wildflowers, important for pollinators like the Mission Blue Butterfly. On the right, you can see a photo taken from this spring, just one year later, and the Mission Blue Butterflies are already using these plants as habitat. This just goes to show you a little bit of work makes a big difference. I like to end my volunteer events on Sign Hill with this puzzling story. Looking out of the sign, you'll notice a stark difference between the outskirts of the letters, which are mostly monocultures of invasive annual plants, and the space between the letters, which hold dense stands of purple needle grass, reminiscent of ancient forests. And to orientate yourself in these photos, the white concrete pictured is the letters, South San Francisco, the industrial city. Within the bunch grasses are wildflowers like blue-eyed grass, checker bloom, and silver lupin. I particularly love this silver lupin gathering around and spilling over the letters like they were rugged rock face. Silver lupin is the host plant for the federally endangered mission blue butterfly. And sure enough, I found these charismatic butterflies flying around South San Francisco, the industrial city. Why? Well, 20 plus years of mowing around the letters so that they would be visible from far away has actually served as invasive plant control. It's kept non-native annual grasses low, reducing their thatch and seed set. The letters and our determination to share their message was a positive habitat creating force. When facing the, seeming, the numerous and seemingly insurmountable environmental challenges ahead of us, it can be easy to brush away those thoughts with statements like, nature persists, it survives no matter what we do. And to be sure, Sign Hill's organisms are tenacious. But I think that lets us off way too easy. It says we don't have to do anything because mother nature will always find a way. From my experience on Sign Hill, I've learned it's a false dichotomy to set us apart from nature. Sign Hill stories tell us that for better or for worse, we are part of this ecosystem. It is up to us to acknowledge our connection to the natural world and to chart a healthier path. I'm proud to work for a city and community that takes this message to heart through their stewardship of a beloved quirky park. And I hope you remember these stories next time you pass by Sign Hill. And I just want to give a, a quick acknowledgement. I couldn't have told it these stories without amazing stewards, organizations, and family members that have helped me along the way. I want to especially thank Josh Richardson, Parks Division Manager, Greg Mediotti, Deputy Director, and Sharon Reynolds, Director of Park, the Parks and Recreation Department, for their immense support and vision for Sign Hill. I also want to thank my coworker, Daniel Simone, Natural Resource Aid, and everyone at San Bruno Mountain Watch who provided me so much advice and guidance when this project began. Finally, I want to thank my wonderful stewards who've dedicated so much of their time to making their local park healthier, as well as my family and partner who are present on this call. So thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate this award. It's such an honor. Cheers, Emma. Uh, my name is Eric Simmons, and I'm the digital editor at Bay Nature. Uh, and it is my great honor to introduce you to Jose Gonzalez tonight. Uh, I've been at Bay Nature for almost eight years now, and I have been fortunate to watch Jose's work from nearly the beginning of that time. Um, I've been thinking quite a bit this week about the way I first met him uh, at a 2014 Bay Area Open Space Council session on environmental storytelling. I actually wonder if some of you may have been there. Um, and Jose, the storyteller, sort of standing under an oak tree and surrounded by this circle of listeners. Um, and there's something in that image that has stuck with me and that captures not just what Jose does, but how he does it. Um, so I hope you know, Jose has quite a track record of accomplishments. Uh, his founding of El Latino Outdoors, the walks and floats and conversations he's led, the trainings and collaborations he does to make the outdoors a more equitable place. 
Uh, he has frolicked in the California wildflowers and he has run in his huaraches across the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, but that image under the oak tree for me captures why Jose has had such success. Uh, he's a teacher, a trainer, a facilitator, and a communicator. And he approaches his work of diversifying the outdoors as one of inviting everyone in and finding our shared stories. Uh, a few days ago, Jose asked on social media uh, what people would say about him in introducing him. And what was, that was one of the suggestions uh, that he has created a safe and joyful place in the outdoors for everyone. Uh, in an article for Bay Nature uh, a couple of years ago, Jose wrote about inviting Latino families to join us on a Sunday family hike to the park. And he wrote about how he saw the dads show up in Tejanas, cowboy hats, leather boots and jeans, and he alone is in his branded outdoor hiking pants. And yet he wrote, everyone had a great time because we were wearing clothes appropriate for comfort and safety. We didn't worry about what was appropriate for being outdoorsy. I think that's the important story Jose tells us, who we are and what we bring with us and what matters and what doesn't when we go outside. And so now here he is, uh, as you'll see under the virtual trees, illuminated uh, even with this unusual setup, uh, readying his slides to teach us. So please join me in honoring and listening to Jose Gonzalez, Bay Nature's 2021 community hero. Great, thank you. I hope you can all hear me well. Um, and I will make sure that we are centered here since Zoom has a way of uh, reminding us that we're all here in this digital space. So first of all, thank you so much. Um, it is a pleasure to be here with all of you tonight uh, and sharing this experience. Eric, that was wonderful. You, you made me want to quickly rush to see if I can find that photo. I believe I have it <laughs> saved somewhere. So I really appreciate that. Um, I'm here because I really uh, am excited about both this opportunity uh, to speak for a few minutes, as well as the gratitude and appreciation um, for this acknowledgement and being here with, with, with all of you. Uh, one is I'm an immigrant from Mexico. Uh, so my name, full name is actually uh, Jose Guadalupe Adonis Gonzalez Rosales with a little bit of the Leon. Um, and it wasn't until I came to the United States that it was really Jose Gonzalez in the way that I think many, many of you who may recognize me. Uh, much of my experience in my early years in Mexico was actually Lupe. Uh, but I think even just coming to the United States and being able to uh, have my mom tell me, well, now you're gonna be Jose and go into the DMV and uh, social you know, try to get my even social security card and how much of the pressure it was to acknowledge that I could only have one last name, for example. So all of those were reminders to me of what it meant to like, when we talk about the, um, the constraints of, of, of a cultural space and, you know, at a young age, I didn't really understand or unpack that, but the, that, because, that became really significant later on in my work as I was trying to understand this idea of culture, not just in terms of an ethnic culture and what it means for me to have a, um, a, a Mexican culture and what that translated as a Latinx culture in the US, but as well as what that meant as an outdoor culture. And ultimately that would lead to the founding of Latino Outdoors. But as an example, I often like to, to use this graph from a 2017 Nature of American Studies. But what do we mean sometimes about like unpacking this a little bit in terms of um, thinking about a racially and ethnically diverse um, set of communities and how they are connected or disconnected or represented or not representative in an outdoor uh, or nature experience. And so the, the idea that you can ask a question like, what is your interest in hiking? And just through the phrasing of that question, um, how demographics, um, you can look at this and be able to have a takeaway that says that black adults have the lowest type of interest in hiking. Um, and you need, it's important to unpack that uh, because if the question is interest in walking outdoors, all of a sudden the percentages jump up. So for me, the question is, what is the, in, what is the difference between hiking and walking outdoors? And it's those types of questions that to me, that type of inquiry, that type of investigation of unpacking and understanding what do we mean about the nuance and complexity with our communities that are important to acknowledge when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, representation, and so forth, the outdoors. And that's been part and core of my work. And it's grounded for me in the fact that um, there is the reality, the fact of the demographic inevitability that by 2050, the demographics of our country, of our state are going to be very different than they were in 1950. So to me, that's the invitation as much as the challenge. It's the opportunity of what does it mean to have a conservation movement 
for the 2050 compared to what it was in 1950, so that we can add to the conservation success, I mean, let alone 1850s. And I think it's understanding and unpacking all of that. So we see this um, as much as it is the challenge as just as the reality of what it means to, to have this type of diverse engagement and where that comes from for me, starting with that immigrant experience. And of course, that has led me to an abundance of opportunities. I think it's the taking the boldness of, <laughs> of that first route, so to speak, that has allowed me to both connect in terms of policy impact and work regionally in the Bay Area. That's uh, that's near Coyote Valley. That's Co Coyote Ridge right there with uh, former Secretary Jewell. Um, some of the National Monument designation uh, work that also allowed me to meet uh, former President Obama. Um, and all of that came from this experience of wanting to, to, to do this work um, and to see myself represented in ways that I felt uh, were unique to me. But it still comes back to this experience. And I think so many of the past heroes and current heroes have spoken to this well. And I think of really, you know, as Clayton so well put the, the work, right, of making those initial connections of what it means to really be in that space with those initial transformative experiences of being to unpack what it means to approach diversity differently than how sometimes communities um, experience this. To know that if we aren't intentional, we may be reinforcing a school to prison pipeline, for example, because of the way that we frame um, as an example, right, the, the, the way that we may frame punitive examples with, with voice of color. And I don't want that to transfer to the outdoors experience. I want that to be a space in which we um, create a lot of these safe and healing experiences that we talk about. And so for me, that has meant unpacking my own culture. What does it mean? I often kind of say I'm Mexicano by birth nationality. I'm U.S. citizen through uh, naturalization. I'm Latino through social cultural identity. I'm Chicano through social political identity. And I'm Hispanic by census count. I say that with a bit of humor. And it is understanding, unpacking that identity because Latino Outdoors was about that diversity and spectrum of the Latinx experience in relation to the diversity of outdoor experiences. Um, and so for me, that's been it, it, its own journey as well. And so I'll close in terms of where this is taking me. Um, this is based off the work of another Bay, uh, Bay Area uh, leader, Dr. Rupi Maria, who shared this at Bioneers a couple years ago. Uh, I think about understanding uh, all of this system of harms. And we talk about things like su su uh, supremacism and colonization and the like, and unpacking all of that. So for me, it's what is the kind of how, do, how are these things that we fight against as much as what are things that we'd fight for? And I think nature continues to provide so much of that modeling, so many of those, so much of those opportunities to look at that the same intention and excitement and energy that we bring to the ecological space is part of the model and the learning in our social spaces. And obviously this year, these past couple of years in California and then in the Bay Area specifically have been impactful, not just in terms of the pandemic, but of course of our learning through wildfire and what it means that to un unpack um, our past practices compounded by climate change as these reminders that we can't be overly suppressive, right? We have to have prescribed burning as an example. We have to pay attention to what the landscape has been asking for and has adapted to as well. And that is an opening, of course, to ancestors and indigenous knowledge. And so that brings me to the present about being able to understand that if we are understanding and unpacking this in the natural landscape, that to me, that's, to me, that's provided this kind of framework to really think about how um, thinking about edge effect and the ecotone and prescribed burning um, and how a river, the emergence of a river, to me, to me those have been models about applying that for our social spaces. And there's a lot of lessons and learnings that have come there. And so I'll close by saying that it's a reminder that the Bay Area um, is so representative of this good work. And I share this because obviously me being honored in this way, to me, it's a recognition and honoring everybody in my uh, ecosystem, some of which are represented here, many of which are not. And it's that reminder that it does take an ecosystem of a community to do this. And I am grateful and will continue to be grateful for that. So with that, I wanna say thank you so much. I am really appreciative of, of, of this honor um, and acknowledge that is one of many steps um, in the continuing work that we do. So muchas gracias, aprecio mucho y espero um, que sé y espero sabiendo que el trabajo va a continuar. Thank you.
Thank you, Jose, for your insightful and thoughtful remarks and giving us new perspective on nature. What a hopeful and reflective way to end this celebratory evening today. Thank you very much to all our local heroes, all five of our local heroes for sharing your work and your passions with us. And thanks to all of you here for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you on Tuesday with Doug McConnell. And please enjoy another song from Rupa and the April Fishes and have a great rest of your evening. Yeah, he do have